Behind me, you'll find a construction site for new homes. In a few short months, this will be a neighborhood full of families excited to be in their brand new houses. One year ago, I spent a lot of time and energy filming the most comprehensive video on the new home construction process, only to realize I left out one key element. So I'm taking a do-over and recreating the most in-depth video on how a house is built by adding the time frame that you can expect the builder to take on each step of the new home construction process. The normal time frame of construction from digging the hole to completion is three to four months but a million different things can go wrong that can cause delays. And often it's not the builder's fault. So let's get to it. Oh man, <laughs> I cannot believe I'm about to do this. Welcome to the most in-depth guide on the home build process. This is a series that you're gonna wanna watch all the way to the end because I'm gonna get you so close to the action that you actually need to dust off when you're done watching. I'm gonna risk my life, most likely destroying my favorite Nordstrom shirt, all because I love you. I'll be pulling back the curtain on everything. Okay, let's get dirty. Before the builder can start to build a home, they need an approved plat map of the community from the city. It will look something like this. The map will show where the roads, parks, green space, and the various home sites will be located. The plat is submitted by a land developer who then sells the lots, also known as home sites, to a home builder. Though, some home builders have their own land development division within their company. Once the city signs off, the developer can start the process of preparing the land. They'll level the land, clearing debris, including trees and sometimes even houses. Often, you'll see multiple vehicles all at once doing various jobs. When the land prep is completed, the developer will install the curb, gutter, and the asphalt roads here like you see behind me. Also part of the process for the land developer is putting in drains like you see here to run excess water away from the community. The builder is also responsible for installing fire hydrants. Okay, so you can see the nail right there in the middle and off to the left would be lot 245. Off to the right would be home site 244. Okay, so now I'm walking out to the back corner of the home site to show you how they mark each corner. Okay, so you notice a stick sticking out of the ground here. This marks the rear corner for two different home sites. So zooming in here, you can see that there's a 243 going off to the right and a 244 going off to the left. And then if you go down here, you'll notice this orange cap with rebar here, and that cannot leave. That needs to stay right there, and that will help the owners of each property to know where their back corner is. This tiny marker is attached to rebar driven deep into the earth. The land development process is more complicated than it sounds, often taking several months, as they also install the sewer, natural gas, electrical and water lines for the entire community and then run each different service to every home site. This is called stubbing which means each utility will be run to every home site but terminated on the other side of the curb so the different trades can tap in from this location and complete the connection to the home at the appropriate time. Okay so this W that's stamped into the curb with the blue paint on it is a great example of stubbing. Right here you can see the water meter. Now the builder can submit your building permit to the city for approval. The permitting process can take a few days or several weeks depending on the city. The builder can start construction on the home after they pick up the permit from the city's building department. They will also need to pay for the permit. This fee is used to cover the cost of inspections to certify that the house is built to local code. These inspections are mandatory. Step number one, the builder will mark the home site using the plot plan as their guide. They'll put these little pegs you see here in the ground and spray paint lines so the excavator knows where to dig. Usually, the builder will mark the home site and dig the next day. Step number two, break ground. A backhoe, like you see right here behind me, is brought in to dig the hole. This house will have a basement. The excavator will dig the hole a few feet wider than the footprint of the house so the different trades have space to work. So this large chunk of dirt sitting right here is where the garage will be located. So there's no reason to dig it out just to fill it back in. But also, this is virgin soil, which means it has been sitting here for probably thousands of years, and it's already compacted, giving the garage and really the house more stability. All right, guys, so we're gonna take you into the hole here and show you what it looks like. The reason I wanted to get you guys so close is because the stability of your home starts right here on this dirt. It's vital 
that your home is built on solid ground, which I'll talk about more in just a minute, but also that the ground is level. The excavator will use special equipment to ensure that it's done correctly. Step number three, an outhouse or porta potty or John, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, is placed on the home site, usually off to one side so it's out of the way. The various tradesmen and tradeswomen who build the homes are expected to use the convenient little stink box instead of the bathrooms inside the house. We'll call this step number four, though it's not always done, and that's testing for collapsible soils. This is usually only done if they see a potential problem. If collapsible soils are discovered, there are multiple solutions. Step number five, they'll pour the concrete footings. The main purpose of these footings is not only to bear the weight of your house, but to also make sure that the weight of your house is evenly distributed to prevent settling. You'll notice that the footings are placed along the entire perimeter of the house. The foundation will be poured on top of these footings. While framing the house, the builder will place a two by four wall resting where you see these interior footings. They do this to bear the weight of the center of the home. If you're finishing a basement, make sure you know where these weight bearing walls are and do not remove them. You'll notice all these pieces of rebar sticking out of the footings. This is done to help secure the foundation wall to these footings. Step number six, they'll pour the foundation walls. Right here behind me is one that's already been completed. Before they can pour the concrete, a crew will come in and set the forms like you see here. I've sped up the process for your viewing pleasure. The forms will be placed on the center of the footings around a rebar cage. This ties into the rebar that was cemented into the footings. The concrete will be poured around the steel cage, increasing the strength and stability of the foundation. From this angle, you can see the gap between the forms where the concrete will be poured. You will also notice wedge two by fours to keep the forms in place. They will also place large steel frames just like this inside the forms to leave openings for basement windows. Next, this strange looking vehicle called a pump truck will arrive spreading its four massive arms for stability. Then, the fifth arm will extend out and above the forms. A giant hose is attached to this arm, allowing the tradesmen to quickly and efficiently complete the task. When ready, multiple concrete trucks will line up behind the pump truck. They'll take turns pouring wet concrete into the back end of the pump truck, which in turn pulls the concrete up through the giant hose, spitting it out the other end. It can take three or four truckloads maybe more to complete the foundation, and it does need to be poured continuously so the concrete bonds together. The pump truck operator will move the massive arm around the perimeter while the guy standing on the form guides the giant hose from the pump truck, keeping it in between the forms and filling it with concrete. The foundation will need a minimum of seven days to cure or harden before framing can start, though most builders will allow more time than that. Concrete continues to cure for about four weeks, at which point it reaches maximum strength. Fortunately, there's still plenty of work that can be done while we wait. Okay, so you'll notice this weird piece of concrete jetting out from the foundation wall. This is what they call a key, and the front door is gonna be right here, and the concrete steps when they're poured will rest on this key, and they'll keep them from sinking. After they've poured the foundation, you'll notice all these little pieces of metal sticking out of the top of the foundation wall right here really close you can see that it looks like a screw right well what they're gonna do is gonna put a pressure treated board on top of here and be able to bolt it down okay and if you follow the foundation wall you'll notice this strange piece of metal sticking out that is called an earthquake strap here in Utah but in other places it might be called a hurricane strap and if you look, there's multiple of these around the house. These straps allow the house to sway during a major storm and hopefully not break. And I'm guessing you wanted a close up. So I've grabbed a hurricane strap right here to show you what it looks like before it goes in. So you can see this thing's gonna sit right about here in the foundation wall and you can see, so a big portion of this is actually gonna be in the concrete wall. And this little bend that you see right here in the hurricane strap keeps it secured in the foundation wall even better. Step number seven, the sub rough sewer and main water lines are going from the street to the home. Okay, peeking inside the foundation wall where the basement will be, you'll notice there are sewer lines run here and those sewer lines will go to future locations for bathrooms, kitchens, and etc. And while we're standing up here, I should just point out really quick that you can see the footings. That's the part that bumps out there at the bottom and the foundation sitting on top of it. 
you'll notice there's this little line of footings right here with no foundation. When they frame the house, they'll put some two by fours resting on those footings. And these footings are there to help hold the weight of the center of the home. Okay, so I wanted to give you guys a close up of these plumbing lines. You can see that's where it's coming from the street. And then if you go between my legs here, continuing through, you can see it kind of runs throughout this area. And you can see one over there, that's gonna be a main drain line, probably for the kitchen. And swing over this direction, you can see several others. This is most likely where a basement bathroom will be placed in the future. Okay, and looking right here, you can see where they punched the main water line through the foundation wall. And you see they put a bunch of tar around it to keep any water penetration from getting into the basement. Steps eight and nine are interchangeable. So I'll say step number eight, the window wells are bolted around the basement windows. So you can see the opening there in the concrete foundation. That's a basement window. And this window well is attached to the exterior to hold back the dirt once this is backfilled. Here's an extreme close up for those of you that care. Step number nine, the damp proof tar is applied to the exterior of the foundation wall. Okay, so you can see they only sprayed it about halfway up the wall, maybe a little higher than that. And that is because the dirt level will come up to that tar, anything that sitting below the ground will want that tar, and that's because concrete is porous and they don't want moisture getting into the basement. You'll also see the 674 right there. That's lot number 674. That way, all the trades know which home site they're working on. And then, of course, if you look right here, this opening is where the garage is gonna be, and you'll notice there's no tar there, and that's because normally this portion of the house is filled with dirt up to this level here. Stepping inside, and looking inside the garage, what do you notice? Damp proof tar, right? That's because the interior of the home, of the basement, the living space will be behind that section. So you know, looking at the tar level, where the garage will sit. Step number 10, the backfill. The backhoe will come in and push all the dirt out here around the hole, filling in around the foundation wall where I'm standing right now. Matter of fact, I think I hear one coming now. Better get out of here. Step number 11, compaction. The builder will use special machinery to condense the soil around the foundation. They'll leave extra dirt against the wall because the soil will continue to settle or sink, sometimes for several years. Okay, so right here you can see a backhoe. It's got the shovel on there, which is used to fill the house. But I want to give you guys a close-up of the tool they use to compact. They'll attach this to the backhoe and it'll roll the thing back and forth, compacting the soil. This weird little machine here, which looks like something out of Star Wars, is actually used to compact the soil around the house. And they'll drive this little machine all around the house and you can see it's little marks everywhere compacting the soil. Step number 12, the basement and the garage floors are poured. This is called flat work. Most builders will wait to pour the driveway to prevent people from driving or parking on it, which could cause damage, forcing them to replace it. Before they can pour concrete in the garage, they'll need to finish backfilling and compacting the soil like you see here. Then the backhoe will dump and spread gravel in the basement and garage areas. Often, they'll also scrape out where the driveway will be located and place gravel in that location as well. Okay, so you can see here, the basement floor was just poured along with the garage. But if you look over here, you can see that the driveway was not poured. Okay, so I'm in the garage portion of the house and I wanted to give you a close up of this gravel you can see here. It's just kind of a fine little gravel there and that's gonna help the concrete workers get a better pour. Step number 13, power is run to the house and this post you see right here is where the electrical panel will be placed on the exterior of the home. Now they won't run power to the house quite yet and because of that, they'll actually place these power posts like you see right here and that will give the framers and other trades the ability to have power while they're doing their work around the house over the next couple weeks. Step number 14, a gas line is run from the street to the home. But the placement of this step is kind of questionable because I've seen the gas line installed at the very end of the construction process when the house is complete. Step number 15, a dumpster, like you see here behind me, is delivered. Over the coming weeks, there will be loads of waste from the different trades. No joke, they will fill that dumpster two or three times for one house. At this point, we can move on to framing, which I'll cover in video number two. Hi, you're watching the most in-depth guide on the home build process. This is video two of a three-part series, and you're not gonna find a more comprehensive explanation of how a house is built. In this episode, I'll explain what happens during the home construction process, starting with the framing and ending with the four-way, which is one of the most important stages 
of the process. If you don't know what the four-way is, you're about to find out. When you're done watching this video, you'll be smarter than the new home construction salesperson who sold you the home. No joke. Okay, so we're gonna start video two, where we ended video number one, and that's with the home at foundation, ready to be framed. They're gonna stick a board right on here called the sill plate, and we're gonna check it out right now. Lumber is delivered usually by one truck and dropped on the home site just after the builder has backfilled around the foundation. They call this a lumber package, and each package is unique to the specific house being built. Now, the framers can start putting sticks in the air. The first thing we're gonna look at is the sill plate, which connects the framing of the home to the foundation. The sill plate is a pressure-treated wood used anytime the framing touches concrete. It provides resistance to mold, fungus, and rot while repelling ants and termites. The entire perimeter of the home will be anchored just like this, which means it would take one heck of a storm to separate the framing from the foundation. And here is a quick close-up of how the home is anchored. You wouldn't use these special planks for interior framing for several reasons, but mostly because it's much more expensive and because the boards have chemicals in them. Okay, so I'm down in the basement and I'm gonna show you the floor joists, which are these boards you see here running across. The floor joists are fastened to the sill plates. The joists rest on each end of the foundation, spanning the entire distance. The joists are engineered support beams that run horizontally the entire length of the floor, but because that length can get so long, the builder will actually put in walls like you see here and over there to help carry the weight of the floor above. I'm back up top to show you how they box in the joists with these headers that you see right here. Next, they're gonna install the floor sheathing. It's a thick layer of plywood or OSB, AKA oriented strand board. The OSB is nailed and often glued to the top of the floor joist. Its sheathing provides a solid base for the framing of the walls and for the finished flooring. It also stabilizes the joist below. Okay, so if you look above my head here, you can see floor joist. I'm on the first floor of a two-story home. Now they got the section here of a dining area and they put a large main beam across to hold the weight of the floor above. I'm gonna zoom in in a second here, but you can see these little metal pieces up here. These are holding the joist onto this main beam to help attach it. Those are called saddles. So you can see that the joist actually rests in that little saddle there. And then they've used nails to help hold that in there. And then look how thick this board is. It's actually three sections of really thick boards to hold the weight of the floor above. Taking a closer look at this main beam, you will notice that it's resting on the top plate, but you can also see they've nailed a whole bunch of studs together to bear the weight of the upper floor. And then of course it's gonna rest here on the foundation of the wall below. And then if we swing on over to the other side, you'll notice that they did the same thing. Now, because this is the most in-depth video on the new home construction process, I wanna give you a close-up of one of those saddle pieces. So you can see here, look, you got the holes where the nails or screws can go in, and then of course your truss is gonna sit right here in the saddle. In the United States, most homes are framed with wood. These planks of lumber are called studs. The interior of homes are almost always framed with two by fours, meaning that the stud is about two inches wide by four inches deep. In many locations around the country, two by fours are also used on the exterior of the home. But in places with extreme temperatures like Utah, most builders frame the exterior wall with two by sixes. Why? Because it allows them to add thicker insulation in the exterior walls, increasing the energy efficiency of the home. More on that later. Walls are framed in sections called wall panels. Stepping in closer, you can see the top plate, which runs across the top there, and the bottom plate, which attaches the wall to the OSB. Studs are usually spaced 16 to 24 inches on center, and they're an important component of support for the home. These wall panels often include windows or door openings, like you see right here. These interior walls, that divide the different spaces within the home are called intersecting walls. These walls are usually not insulated. They're often attached to the exterior wall panel with a wall ladder like you see right here. The ladder back is several short horizontal studs running from the floor all the way up to the top plate. Okay, so you're looking at where a window will be placed. 
you'll notice a header board that runs across the top there. Stepping in a little closer, you'll notice a grouping of studs that are stuck together, and that's gonna help hold the weight of the house above. Looking at where the front door will be placed, you can see that it's framed much the same way. While we're looking at the framing really quick, I just wanted to show you also, you can see this is a two by six board here for the exterior of the home. And this is a standard two by four, which a lot of builders will use in a lot of locations. Here's the difference. You can see that's a two by four versus a two by six. Look how much more insulation you can get in between the walls of this exterior versus the two by four exterior. All right, looking over my shoulder here, you'll see where they've already boxed in for a future fireplace. That will be a gas fireplace, but you've also see that they've already pre-insulated in that location and they do that because right now it's easy once the fireplace box is in place it'll be too hard next they'll install the manufactured wall panels also known as sheathing to the exterior of the framed walls it's the same material that they use for the flooring but it's often thinner the osb interlocks with a tongue and groove system the sheathing ties the framing together to solidify the wall system and provides a surface for installing the stucco siding or whatever Taking a closer look, you can see that it's pieces of wood compressed and glued together. It is not waterproof, but it is water resistant. So if it snows or rains while your house is being built, don't worry about it. While we're on the exterior of the home, I just wanna show you the earthquake or hurricane straps right there. So you can see how they're attached to the home. Now let's head upstairs to the second floor so I can show you the truss system look up above. Okay, looking above my head here, you can see the roof trusses. This framing determines the shape of the roof and the ceiling. Trusses are pre-engineered in a factory and shipped to the home site. Trusses are raised usually one by one and attached to the exterior walls. They're engineered to carry the weight of the roof to the exterior weight bearing framing, keeping the pressure off the interior walls. When all the rafters are in place, they'll install the sheathing like you can see here above my head. This ties everything together and provides a surface for the installation of the roof. The whole framing process, all the way to the sheathing, usually takes 10 to 14 days. So I'm in a different house to show you a different kind of truss system. If you look up here, you can see this one is more V-shaped. So this house will have a vaulted ceiling in this main room. Okay, I promised you in video number one that I'd risk my life and this is where it all begins. Or is this where it all ends? Step number 17, the roof is installed. The first thing that the roofers are gonna do is they're gonna attach this asphalt product called underlayment to the sheathing. So you can see the sheathing here. This is the asphalt product. It's made of a material called roofing felt, which is like tar paper. It acts as a second layer of waterproofing. Next, the shingles and the flashing are installed. They'll start at the edge or the bottom portion of the roof and work their way up to the peak. Here's a close up of the peak. In sections where the roof meets a chimney or a wall, they'll use these L-shaped metal flashings here that go underneath the asphalt shingles. Special aluminum pieces are also installed around any pipes or vents that stick out of the roof. Eaves, gutters, and downspouts are usually done later on in the process, so I will talk about that later on, but let's move on to the four-way process. During the four-way, several trades are in the home and often all at the same time. I will list each as a separate part of the home build process but the order in which these items are completed are interchangeable. Before I get to it, I should explain that the four-way is the combination of final projects to be completed before the sheetrock, also known as the drywall, is hung. It's your last chance to see the guts or bones of the home. For this reason, the city requires an inspection, which I'll talk more about in just a minute. The four-way is the completion and inspection of the framing, electrical, HVAC, and plumbing. So now that the house is completely framed, the other three trades can get to work. The start date for each trade is often spaced apart a little, but it is common to see two or three of the trades in the house all at the same time. Step number 19, the HVAC is installed. We're gonna head on down here to the basement to show you the ductwork. For those of you that don't know, HVAC is the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system running throughout the home. The ductwork, like you see up here above me, is installed before plumbing or electrical because it's a lot easier for the plumber and electrician to work around the ductwork rather than the other way around. I've turned the camera around so you can kind of see here what the ductwork looks like. It's all this metal that you see running through the home and it's gonna come on down here to the furnace. And I'm gonna spin this around here and give you a view of the furnace from this angle. And we'll be talking more 
about the furnace here in just a minute. Next, they're gonna place some AC units outside of the home. Down here in the basement, they're gonna place the furnace. If the house is large, you can have two air conditioners and two furnaces. In Utah, the first furnace is usually placed in the basement, like you see right here. If another one is needed, it's often placed on the second floor of the house or in the attic. This is done to maximize the efficiency. When everything is in place, the HVAC installer will turn everything on to make sure it's working correctly. If the home has a fireplace, the HVAC company is usually the one to do that as well. Step number 20, electrical. At this point, the main electrical box is attached to the exterior of the home, like you see right there. The power is run underground from the street to this box, giving power to the home. This gray line is the main power coming into the house from outside. You're gonna notice something else here. You're gonna notice this green wire right here. This is attached to this piece of rebar right here, which goes all the way down into the earth. It goes down deep. And that protects the house against any sort of major power surge, like a lightning strike or something like that. This orange cord right here, it just goes to an exterior outlet box. Once again, that thick gray line is the main power coming to the house. And you can see this green line is tied into this piece of rebar that goes all the way down into the foundation. If you look up here, you can follow this line. It's gonna take you to the main power source of the house. Then the main breaker panel will be installed in the basement. From this location, the electrician will specify where power goes, running wires from the box to each room. The main power right here in this gray line is the power coming into the main breaker panel. The electrician will also place electrical boxes, AKA junction boxes, around the house and run the appropriate wiring to each of these locations for future power outlets, light switches, and smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Every bedroom in the home will have a detector. They're all linked together by a permanent power source with a battery as backup. So if one goes off, all the others will as well. Behind me is where the kitchen will be located in the future. There's a lot of power coming into the kitchen. Code <laughs> limits the amount of power coming to each area. So the refrigerator, oven, dishwasher, and disposal will each have their own power source dedicated specifically to them on a breaker in the main power box below. The lighting will also be on its own breaker as well as the electrical outlets. GFCIs, also known as GFI outlets, must be placed in any location near a water source like a kitchen and bathroom. A GFI outlet contains sensors that monitor the surge of electricity in the wiring, which keeps you safe from getting shocked. I'll talk more about GFIs later. Electricians will also run low voltage wiring. Low voltage is often for lighting, doorbells, thermostats, cable for TV, phones, and network wiring for the internet. For the time being, all power will be terminated in a junction box until the home nears completion. See right here? And if you look behind me, you got the future thermostat wiring right there. And then just giving you a close up, this is where your low voltage will go right through here. You can see it's kind of an empty little box here, but it makes it easier for the sheet rockers to get around that and leaves a clean look once it's completed. Step 21, plumbing. At this stage, the plumber will run drain lines and water lines to the appropriate locations. The thick black pipes run the sewage and wastewater out of the home to the sewer main at the street. This is the main water line coming into the house. This handle gives you the ability to turn off the water to the entire house in emergency. Okay, so you can see right here was where the main water comes in from the street and following it up, it takes water to the other parts of the house. One of the last things the plumber will do is install a water heater which will be placed in that location right there. The plumber will also run water lines to the appropriate locations in the house where water is needed, terminating or capping off each location until the home nears completion. Coming in closer here, you can see these two loops. This right here is gonna be for the water heater, and this is for a future water softener should the homeowner decide to add one. I also wanna point out while we're down here, you can see this thick black line running down here. That's the gas line, and you can see that's running over here into the furnace. And you might be wondering what this strange white pipe is behind me. Often, the builder will install a radon mitigation system like you see here. Comes out of the concrete like that, right there. Goes all the way up to the attic. This is not an active system. It's in place in case the homeowners notice that there is radon in the home. It's impossible to test for radon at this part of the construction because all the windows are open all the time and people are coming in and out of the house. Once the homeowners move in, they can test the home for radon 
and should it be found that there's too much radon in the home, they can install a fan and this will suction it up out through the basement, out of the house, making it safe for people to live down here. Tubs and shower surrounds are also installed at this point. Taking a closer look, you can see the water lines coming in to where the tub is going to be located. And they haven't put the shower surround in yet. You can see the drain is right there and the water lines are run for the handle and the future shower head right there. And looking behind here, you can see this is the master bathroom. You've got double sinks. That's why you have the black tubes going to the right and to the left. You can also see the main water lines coming up from the floor. Like I was talking about earlier, they are terminated. You can see they're capped off until needed in the future. And then of course they've got these metal plates right here. And that's gonna keep the sheet rockers from sticking a screw into any of those pipes. Step 22, the windows and the doors are installed. This usually takes place near or at the end of the four-way process before the city inspection. In the master bedroom upstairs, they've got a huge sliding glass door. Okay, so this house is nearing the end of its four-way process. You can see the main power box has been installed right here. They've got some breakers in there. That's where the main power, like I said, is coming into the house. Okay, and then looking behind me here, you notice these things sticking out of the wall. I mean, what is that? I mean, someone could poke their eye out with that thing, right? Well. This is gonna go to your main air conditioners. And because there's two of them, that's telling you this is a large house, so we need two AC units. Let's step inside the house and follow these to see where they're going. So the one on the left looks like it's going up and the one to the right is most likely going down. So let's follow them, see where they're going. Okay, oh boy. Okay, once again, I'm risking my life for you guys. There we go. All right, okay, there we go. You can see, got the furnace right there. So. This one line right here, you can see it. It's coming down into the furnace. And then of course you notice the gas line there. This gas line also feeds the furnace. It's gonna feed the water heater and the gas line continues and it goes upstairs to where the kitchen is. And of course you've got your two loops here, one for the water heater and one for a future water softener. And then swinging back this direction, you can see that the main electrical panel for the basement has been pretty much installed and most of the wiring has run to the places. We're just waiting for all the breakers to be installed. And then moving from the main electrical panel, you notice all these little wires hanging down right here. These are gonna be for your cable, internet, and things of that nature. Now let's head upstairs to see where that other main line is going from the outside. Okay, so there's where it comes in from the outside. You can see it goes up there. So it looks like we're gonna have to head up to the second story to see where that line is running. I know your time is valuable, so I'm running. All right. Oh, look, we found it. Coming to the second floor here, you can see the gas line right here. And that's gonna be run over into the furnace. And here you go. So this is the upstairs furnace. And you can see, here's where the line is coming in. So they ran it all the way up to the attic and down and Putting it on the second story like you see here makes everything more energy efficient. Above our heads here, you can see these black tubes. These run the air to all the different rooms. Okay, one other thing to point out here, you notice this little box here with this little line running to the outside. This is your bath fan. So that line will run the stinky air or the bad air out of the home. I wanted to give you a close up of this plumbing for this half bath and it's gonna go on the main floor. You'll notice this metal bar right here. This is actually huge. You can see they've clipped in the hot water and the cold water and that's gonna help hold these things in place. Again, talking a little bit more about the kitchen, you can see right here, the gas line has been popped up through the floor from the basement and that's gonna be for the stove. But you can see also right here, they've got extra power. You notice that's a little thicker than this wire right here. This is gonna be your normal electrical wire coming to the house, right? That's gonna be a normal outlet right there. This is gonna give you more power for something like a stove or a dishwasher. And then traveling up the wall here, you will notice a normal outlet that is most likely gonna be for a microwave. If we spin around from right here, you can see there's gonna be a kitchen island right here. And those water lines sticking out of the floor means that there is going to be a sink there. So you can see the sink and then the drain pipe, right? The black one is the drain pipe. And then the white line is for cold water, red line is for hot water. Also, you're gonna notice the metal hole in the floor. This is the aluminum, but this is where the heat and the cool air is gonna come out of the floor and they'll put a piece that pushes the air out into the kitchen from inside the island. 
And then if we move from the island to the other side here, you can see this is where the refrigerator is gonna go. Uh, you'll notice two large drain pipes here. These are actually coming from upstairs and going down into the basement. But that is where a water line is gonna come in for the refrigerator right here. And then of course, there's the outlet. Looking up at the ceiling, you can see that the can lights have been placed. Step 23, the four-way inspection. A city inspector will look over the entire home, confirming that everything has been done to code. This includes the framing, HVAC, electrical, and plumbing, among other things. The inspector will also confirm that the proper egress has been given to each basement window. The window wells need to be deeper in locations where bedrooms might be located and a ladder might be placed so people can easily get out of the basement in an emergency. Most builders will schedule a four-way walkthrough with home buyers as well to confirm everything has been done as expected. This is your last chance to move anything like electrical outlets, cable, and etc. Though many builders won't allow you to move anything unless they made the mistake. Don't be shocked or worried if the builder fails the first four-way inspection. It's actually pretty common. The city inspector will call out a few items for the builder to fix, usually returning the next day to sign off that everything has been done correctly. Step number 24, the insulation contractor arrives and places insulation in the wall cavities between the studs. This can be long rolls of insulation, or some people choose to have it blown in, like you see here behind me, for better energy efficiency. They'll also blow insulation into the attic. If the basement is unfinished, they'll pin large sheets of insulation against the concrete walls, like you see here behind me. The city inspector will return to confirm that the home has been insulated properly, which will take us to video number three. Okay, that's it for video number two of the most in-depth video on the home build process. Now, on to video number three. Okay. This is the final installment of the most in-depth video on the new home construction process. Today's video will take you from drywall to a completed home. When you're done watching this video, you'll know things about the new home construction process that many construction managers don't. Be sure to watch to the end because I'm gonna make a recommendation to ensure the builder delivers your home better than any of the other homes in the neighborhood. Okay, let's finish things off. So now that the house has passed the four-way inspection, work can resume. Often, you'll have one group working on the inside and at the same time, others working on the exterior. And many of these steps are interchangeable, but for the most part, this video will be chronological. Step number 25, the sheetrock, AKA the drywall, is delivered. The number and size of drywall sections will be ordered specifically for each house to minimize the number of seams that the sheetrock will have throughout the home. The sections of drywall can be up to 16 feet long and they are heavy. For two-story homes, they'll often pop out or open a window upstairs and use a crane to deliver the planks needed to complete the second floor. The remaining sheets are often left in the garage or in sporadic locations on the main floor. Usually, the mud and tape are delivered at the same time and left in a giant pile in one of the front rooms, like you see right here. Because sheetrock is so easily damaged, it comes in pairs with the sides they'll be facing outwards pressed together. I wanna to give you a close-up. When you peel this paper off right here, it reveals the two sides are pressed together. This brown edge right here will be stuck against the studs, and then this gray interior side, this was protected, that's gonna face outwards into the room. There are basically two types of sheetrock. Most of the home will be hung with these gray planks that you see right here behind me, but they'll use a special sheetrock for the wet areas, such as the bathrooms. These planks are made out of the same material, but they have a heavier coating of paper that's protected by wax for water resistance. It's often called green or blue board, but it comes in various colors. You'll notice that there's a sheen on this, and I'll turn the camera around to give you a close up. Sheetrock is usually secured to the wall with screws, like you see here. If you look really closely, you'll see that there's damage, and you'll notice that it's not super snug up there in that little crack right there. Sheetrock does not need to be snug, and I'll show you why in just a minute. The sheet rockers will also cut out around all the electrical outlets, vents, and lighting fixtures like you see right here. Hanging sheetrock usually takes two to five days depending on the size of the house and the number of tradesmen assigned to that project. When it comes to hanging the drywall, there's always a lot of waste. Step number 26, mud, tape, and texture. Now that the drywall is hung, 
Tape and joint compound, often called mud, will be used to cover the seams. Taking a closer look, you can see that the tape is a roll of thick paper, which they'll use to cover the locations where the sheetrock comes together. The joint compound we pushed into the cracks during this process. The mud also moistens the tape for good adhesion. Now when it comes to any of your corners, like you see here, hopefully you can see that, that is a rounded corner. You usually have the option to do round or square corners. Your square pieces can look kind of like this, right? And so the round one here, you'd have the square one. And they're gonna put the screws through these little holes here to hold that in place. Now, on your windows, they're always gonna use the square ones to give it that clean edge. So here's a close-up of the window to show you that squared edge. So you can see, if you look right here, the joint compound is used to smooth everything out. The mudding and taping process reinforces the joints and conceals the screws. To reach a higher location in the room, a brave worker will put on some stilts and some trades will use a bazooka. This gun releases mud and tape at the same time, drastically increasing the speed at which the taping can be completed. After seeing how much quicker this is, I'm not sure why they don't all use bazookas. Or instead of using stilts, they can always use something like this that you see here behind me. Here's a view of a fully sheetrocked home. Now, the dark, thick lines that you see is where the tape is, and if you come in close, these really thin ones, that's covering the screw heads. Once the home's been completely mudded and taped, and the joint compound has dried, they'll come back and sand everything down. Skilled tradesmen will leave a thin coat of mud to lessen the amount of sanding needed to smooth things out. When done correctly, you won't be able to see the seams or screws, and the walls will be as smooth as butter. The final step is to texture the walls and the ceilings. This will give everything a nice finish. In many locations throughout the United States, they'll also hang sheetrock in the garage as fire coat. It will only receive a basic mud and tape job and will not be sanded or painted. Usually at this point, work has begun on the exterior, so let's go check it out. Step number 27, the driveway is poured. This can be done anytime, but it often falls within this time frame. They framed in this one, it's ready to go for the concrete. And then looking next door, you can see one that's just been completed. Okay, so putting the drone up in the air to give you a top view of the concrete being poured, you can see that the cement truck has just finished dumping its load. And you see the gentleman on the left and the right smoothing it out to make it look nice. Okay, so looking here, you can see that they have finished the driveway and smoothed it out. And panning this direction, you can see that they've also finished the steps leading up to the front porch. Okay guys, once again, I'm risking my life to get you up close and personal with the new home construction process. If you look behind me here, we're talking about step number 28, the soffit and the fascia. It protects the exposed studs or rafters from the elements, increasing the life of the materials and reducing the chance of mold. This also gives the home a nice finished look. Step number 29, stucco or siding, sometimes both, are installed. They start by placing scaffolding around the perimeter of the home. Next, they'll wrap the entire house with a weather barrier. The windows and doors will already have a barrier, which was placed when they were installed. This paper-like sheathing is the primary defense against water penetration. Next, they'll attach mesh, wire, or something else to create a small gap between the weather barrier and the siding which allows water to drain and for the home to air out. Now, they can install the siding or stucco. Siding is installed similar to shingles. They'll start at the bottom and work their way up. Older homes will often have wood or plastic siding, but today, it's more common for them to have a much more durable cement fiberboard like they've installed on this house here. Stucco is also a cement product. They'll start by applying what they call a scratch coat. The first layer is just thick enough to cover the wire grid. They'll often use a notched trowel creating channels so the next coat will easily bond to it. Then, 48 hours later, they'll apply what they call a brown coat. This will have a smoother finished look and need seven days to cure. Notice I did not say dry. Stucco needs to stay moist while it's curing. Then, the finished coat is applied. This final layer comes in many colors, so hopefully you don't have to paint. You cannot install stucco if the weather is above 90 degrees or falls below 40. This is why in the winter, you might see a tented house with heaters cranking to keep the temperatures in the right range. Step number 30, brick or stone will be installed. 
This frequently happens before stucco and often much later. But to keep things chronological, what's happening on the exterior, I'm just gonna mention it now. Okay, let's head back inside. Step number 31, baseboards, door casing, shelving, and etc., is installed. They call this the finish work. They'll hang the doors along with the door frames. Then the interior doors will be removed and placed in the basement or the garage. Why? Because the door frame needs to be in place when they're hanging the trim and the doors just get in the way. Removing the doors also makes it easier to paint. At this stage, the finish workers will install baseboards along the floor and casing around the doorways. They call this base and case. Many builds will include a windowsill like you see here because it looks nice and it's a lot tougher than the drywall. The railing for the staircase and the handrail is installed as well, though many builds will wait until after the home is painted to hang the handrail. Wooden fireplace mantles are installed along with mudroom benches and any wood shelving in places like the laundry room, mudroom, kitchen pantry, and closets. If home comes with metal or wire shelving, that will be installed after the home has been painted. Step number 32, caulking and paint. Now that the trim and shelving has been installed, it's time to caulk. They use a latex caulk because it can be painted and it's good for filling gaps and giving the home a clean look once it has been painted. This shelf here shows an example of what it looks like after it has been caulked. Then looking here at this windowsill, you can see that it's been caulked as well, fills in all the gaps and smooths out all the cracks. When the caulking has been completed, the painters will fix plastic over the windows and tape off anything else that shouldn't get painted. Then they'll stand up the doors in locations where they won't get in the way. This is often the garage or the basement, but sometimes just up against a wall. They'll also lay out anything else not attached to the home that needs to be painted. This would be things like the stair rail. Okay, now that everything is taped off or covered in plastic, we're ready to paint. You do not want to be in the house at this time as paint fumes will fill the air, making it hard to breathe. It reminds me of the time I went to a Tom Petty concert, except it wasn't paint fumes, if you know what I'm saying. Anyway, they'll use a spray gun to paint the entire house, often starting with the primer and then coming back the next day to add a second coat. This second coat of paint will be the colors that you selected. Painting can take three to seven days depending on the size of the house or if you've chosen to go with one tone, two tone or three tone paint. Okay, so this house has had the base coat or the primer done. And then if you look really closely down here at the baseboards, they've been painted. Can you see that they are a little bit whiter? So that means next they'll come in and tape off this trim and then paint the house the color that this particular buyer has selected. Now I should mention that you're likely to see painting mistakes like overspray after the painters are gone. Don't worry about it. The painters will come back and touch everything up as the home nears completion. When they're done painting, all these doors here will be reinstalled. Step number 33, decks and final concrete. Outside, concrete is poured for the walkways, patios, and the small section in front of the driveway. A deck or steps will also be built in the rear of the home, depending on the slope of the lot and what the plans call for. So you can see on this house, the rear decking is being installed. They have poured the rear pad here and they've poured the stairs going down to a separate basement entrance, which they've covered while they finish the exterior of this home. This includes the required patch of concrete here that's poured outside of this garage door exit. Often, they'll need to bring a curb cutter and remove the section of curbing where the driveway entrance will be located. Step number 34, the large aluminum garage doors are installed. This includes the garage door opener or openers if there are two of them. Step number 35, wood or tile floors like you see here in this bathroom are placed. These types of floorings are placed before cabinets to give it the cleanest look and it's easier to install or replace appliances. Wood and tile flooring should also outlive the cabinets, making it easier to replace the cabinets in the future. Step number 36, cabinets are installed in the bathrooms, the kitchen, and sometimes the laundry room. This is a big deal because cabinets are notorious for causing delays. Why? Because cabinets need to be built to fit each unique or individual home. This means cabinets need to be ordered months in advance if there's any hope for them to be completed on time. 
be prepared for possible delays at this stage. Once cabinets have been installed, many builders knowing that there shouldn't be any more major delays moving forward, they'll give you a closing date. 45 days seems to be a popular choice. Step number 37, laminate and or vinyl floors are installed, not to be confused with step number 35. These flooring types are done after cabinets are installed because number one, cabinets outlive these flooring types. It would be tough and expensive to replace flooring if you also had to remove cabinets. Number two, laminate is what they call a floating floor, which means it expands and contracts for different reasons. Placing cabinets on this type of flooring could cause it to warp or bubble. Laminate also snaps together. It would be difficult to replace planks that were installed under the cabinets. Step number 38, outside the final grading is completed on the home site to ensure proper drainage away from the home and to prepare the ground for landscaping. The soil immediately around the foundation will continue to settle for several years, so it's normal that the builder will pile additional dirt around the perimeter of the house. The sprinkler system has already been installed on this house. Now they'll bury those long tubes you see there and install drip lines. At this point, most major tasks have been completed. Similar to the four-way, several different trades will end up in the house at the same time. Once again, much of this work doesn't need to be completed in any specific order. The sequence of the projects to be finished generally goes as follows, and it can all happen quick. Hold on to your hard hats, I'll be moving fast. Step number 39, the final electrical will be completed. The electricians will place the outlet and light switch covers, add final trim to can lights, hang fans, lighting fixtures, and etc. Low voltage will also be completed. This includes your doorbell. They'll also confirm the electrical is working properly throughout the house. Step number 40, final HVAC will be completed. Vent covers will be placed over the openings on the floor and screwed into the ceilings. Air return grills will also be installed along with the thermostat or thermostats if there are two separate units. Step number 41, final plumbing will be completed. Toilets, sinks, and plumbing fixtures will be installed. This includes shower heads, handles, faucets, and drain plugs. The garbage disposal is also installed under the kitchen sink. And if you ordered a water softener, it will be placed as well. Step number 42, knobs or poles for cabinets are installed if you ordered them. Step number 43, the carpet is installed. This is done so late in the process because a lot of people come in and out of the house, especially right at the end. Many of those who enter the home are dirty and they forget to take their shoes off. Carpets get stained a lot more than you'd like to think and the stains are often hard to remove. Things like paint, oil, tar, or some mysterious sludge drag in on the bottom of someone else's shoe. Step number 44, bathroom mirrors and shower doors are installed. Step number 45, appliances are installed. Most builders include a stove, a microwave, and a dishwasher with the home. But if you've added a refrigerator, a washer, or a dryer, they will also be installed at this time. I recommend that you add all appliances with the builder instead of buying them on your own for several reasons. Yes, you'll likely pay more, but not only will the builder place the items for you, but also hook up any water lines and repair any damage that was caused in the installation process. Because many of these items are heavy and bulky, you could end up digging walls or scratching floors by installing them on your own. Step number 46, landscaping. The sprinkler system with the drip lines will be installed. Then the trees and shrubs will be planted. Often a weed barrier is spread before the bark or other decorated ground cover is spread in the flower beds. Sod is installed last and the sprinkler system is tested to ensure proper coverage. Now everything is done. Well, almost. Usually there are random tasks still to be completed due to damage or mistakes in product orders. And then of course there are always dents and dings in the walls that need patchwork or paint touch-ups. This final part of the process is handled differently by each builder. So I'm gonna give you the steps as they should be completed. This is the system that most good builders have adopted. Step number 47, a quality walk will be performed by a representative of the builder. This is usually a construction manager. They'll create a punch list of items that still need to be completed. Common items are missing window screens, caulking, a broken window, missing or broken cabinet doors or drawers, lighting, or plumbing fixtures and things of this nature. 
Usually, the builder's representative will use blue tape to mark locations where there are dings in the walls that need to be repaired or where paint touch-up is needed. Most builders will also do a basic cleaning. Step number 48, a final inspection by a city building code official. If the house fails any part of the inspection, a follow-up inspection will be scheduled. And usually it's just the next day to confirm everything has been corrected. Just like the four-way, it's fairly common for builders to fail the first inspection. It's not a big deal. When passed, the city inspector will issue a certificate of occupancy, also known as a CFO. This means you can now move into the house, but most builders will have you wait a few more days for final repairs and touch-ups to be completed. And this leads us to step 49, the homeowner orientation or final walkthrough for the buyer. A builder's representative will give you a tour of the property and explain how to operate the various systems and components of the home. This is things like the thermostat, the electrical panel, the main water shutoff valve, as well as the individual shutoff valves throughout the house and things of this nature. they will also describe what's covered in the home warranty and how to submit a warranty request. And they'll give you a brief explanation of your responsibilities for maintenance and upkeep of the home. Most builders will also allow you to walk through the home with blue tape to mark any damage or paint touch ups that they may have missed. Just so you know, the builders might not fix every little thing that you find. When the builder has completed everything on the punch list, they'll schedule a final deep cleaning. Step number 50, the house is finally finished and you're clear to close. Before you can go to the title company, a lot of builders will let you walk through the home to confirm the items on the punch list have been completed. Then you'll sign the final closing documents and send your funds to the builder. When the home funds and records with the city, you receive keys to your brand new home. Congratulations. As promised, here's my recommendation to make sure the home is delivered as beautiful as possible. One of the most important stages of the home build process is the homeowner orientation. This is your last chance to ask the builder to repair or replace things. Do not go into this appointment blind. You need to watch the new home final walkthrough where I go in depth to explain what you should look for and what to expect. That video will ensure you have a smoother closing and that the builder does not take advantage of you. Now, because I love you, I need to recommend a few videos to ensure you have the best possible experience when building a home. If you haven't started the home build process yet, be sure to watch how to choose a home builder and how to save money when building a home. If your home is already under construction, you'll want to watch everything you need to know about the four-way and the new home final walkthrough. I have dozens of videos to guide you through the home build process. I'll put links to the most popular videos below. If you're looking to buy, sell, build a home, or invest in Utah real estate, I get contacted all the time. Please feel free to call or text me with your questions. I'd love to meet you and I'm honored to serve you. For everyone else, please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. I always do my best to respond to each one of you. If you have a friend or a family member looking to build a home, you can easily text this video to them. And please don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and ring the bell to be notified each time I post new videos. Also, you can find me on Instagram at Ty the Real Estate Guy. If you found this information helpful, please give me a thumbs